Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the April Silo Foundation webinar. I'm Cindy Davidson, the Education Trustee for Silo Foundation, and today we're delighted to welcome a stellar lineup of top insurance officials from across the country discussing regulatory priorities at the NEIC for 2021 and led by our very own Regulatory Relations Trustee, Fred Karlinski, who co-chairs the Insurance Regulatory and Transactions Group Practice, that's a mouthful, at Greenberg Traurig. Greenberg Traurig is also the sponsor for today's webinar, so huge virtual round of applause for their generous support. We have one hour, and even though we will be muting the attendees, sorry about that, to keep the noise down, you can enter questions in Q&A, and we'll try to get to them as time allows. Please let us know if you're having any technical issues. We'll try to help you out. And now I will turn things over to Fred Karlinski. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Cindy. And thanks to the commissioners and the director who are on with us today. And let me just say a little word about SILA and SILA Foundation. As, as Cindy pointed out, I've been involved with SILA and SILA Foundation for many years as the regulatory trustee and as the counsel for the group. And the work that we do is so important to the industry. And, and so I appreciate everyone's involvement uh, from the attendees today, as, as well as the uh, speakers. We appreciate the support of SILA and of the industry. So, wow, what a lineup we have here today. If you think about it, we have two past NAIC presidents in Jim Donlin and Director Ray Farmer. We have a future likely uh, NAIC president, at least one in, in Andy Mays uh, with us as well. We have the longest serving appointed insurance commissioner in Jim Riddling with us. We have the longest serving elected commissioner and the second longest serving elected commissioner in Mike Kreidler and, and Jim Donlin. So I can't think of a better panel to talk about what's going on in the crazy world that we're living in in 2021. We've spent the last 14 years, 14 months, so geez, it sounds like years, seems like years, <laughs> right? Dealing with COVID. Uh, we had a record hurricane season. We had a derecho in the Midwest, which no one even knew about before it happened. And wildfires certainly have been um, on the forefront of everyone's mind, not only in the West, but when you're thinking about reinsurance and how that's all gonna play out. In addition, we had a number of different issues over the last year that really uh, made the nation rethink some of its thoughts in, in terms of social justice and other things. And so all those things happened in the last year, and, and we still had the conflation of, of a number of other things that have been pressing uh, in the insurance industry, in our world, and in the United States um, over the course of the last um, year or so. So joining us today, is, as I mentioned, are Jim Donlin, Mike Kreidler, Ray Farmer, Andrew Mays, and Jim Riddling to talk about some of these issues. The format's gonna be fairly simple. Each of the commissioners and, and the director, um, Ray Farmer, will talk about what's going on a little bit in their state at, at the NEIC level and their NEIC portfolio. And then we'll have a dialogue between us and hopefully if we have some time, we will um, be able to uh, ask, answer some questions from the audience. In that regard, um, I will start with uh, by alphabetical order with uh, Commissioner Riddling. For those that don't know, as I mentioned earlier, Commissioner Riddling is the longest serving appointed insurance commissioner, having served right now under three uh, different governors in the state of Alabama, originally from Arkansas. Prior to becoming insurance commissioner, uh, Commissioner Riddling was a very successful insurance executive and a very successful businessman. He's been in Montgomery since 1987, and he is the perennial chair of the Southeastern Zone and one of the people that is most highly respected in the NAIC um, leadership. Commissioner Riddling, thank you for being here today, and thank you for all you do for our industry. Would you like for me to say a few words? I would love for you to do that. Well, uh, let me say that in Alabama, our I would call it the casualty side of our business, whether it be private passenger automobile, commercial casualty, uh, and the bond side is very stable, uh, very competitive, 
with with the coastal exposure and being in the middle of Tornado Alley, we do have challenges on the property side that I think most people in this uh, listening understands and and has been updated several times. We we um, participate obviously very actively in our wind pool at the coast. Um, and it is an association, not a governmental body, and we like it that way. The companies of their own volition started the association, and to be licensed in property insurance in the state of Alabama, you must be a member of the association. That is the strength of our coastal exposure. On the Tornado Alley side, um, I'm amazed at how competitive and how persistent the industry is in supporting the state of Alabama with that exposure known to everyone. Thank you, Fred. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Ridling, for all you do. And, and we'll be looking forward to having a more robust dialogue with you on some of the topics that are out there relating to Alabama as well as the NAIC. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce someone who um, I believe will be a likely NAIC president in the future. He's just a tremendous guy and we were all thrilled when Governor Lamont um, appointed him as insurance commissioner. Uh, Andy Mays had, has had a history in the insurance industry, including a tenure at the New York uh, Department of Financial Services, before it was the Department of Financial Services of the New York Insurance Department, as well as with Deloitte. He has a history of public service and that history has, has, is, has shined in everything he's done, including his work as Connecticut's Insurance Commissioner and at the NAIC. So Commissioner Mays, we're, we're pleased you're here and, and would love to hear some of your thoughts. Thank you, Fred. It's really great to be here as I'm looking around. This is a an incredibly distinguished group. Not sure how you managed to get me in. Somebody made a mistake, but I'm just gonna keep talking so <laughs> I can stay here. Uh, yeah, I, I, during our pre-conversation, you'd mentioned that you wanted, you would like me to discuss the concerns facing or some of the major concerns facing us in Connecticut. Would this be a good time to do that or would you like to do that later? It'd be a great time to do that. All right, let me, let me just start off. It's been an interesting tenure. It certainly has been an interesting year. And I'm going to, you know, steal Director Farmer's line because I knew he was going to use it. So I have to harass him. It's not, you know, what we expected. It hasn't been the year we expected, but it's been the year we have. We've got a number of large health insurance companies that are domiciled here, as well as property casualty companies and life companies. So we've seen the gamut of what uh, COVID and the social justice issues have done. And it's good, at least from my side, I think we're heading towards the other side, and that's a good thing. You know, we've managed to make it through as an industry, as regulators, we've all made it through what is a, you know, with luck, a once in a lifetime concern, a once in a lifetime issue. And the fact that we are all here and nobody's sweating. We've all, you know, this industry has managed to make it through a huge stress test. And it's a tribute to the regulators that you see around me. It's a tribute to the NAIC. And that's one of those things that I am, you know, you'd mentioned that I've been elected secretary treasurer. And I'm really proud and I'm hum humbled by that because I think it's a great responsibility. I am a strong believer in state insurance regulation. And I look at the people around me and <laughs> that tells you why. You know, moving forward in Connecticut, let me touch on some, well, there, there are three big items I'd like to touch on. One is big data, one is climate change, and one is diversity and inclusion. Now, we start off, let's start off with big data, because that's probably the most recent thing if you've been following the news. Uh, it's April, uh, about a month, about a week ago, I think, we introduced a notice to industry, the Connecticut Insurance Department did that outlined our department's advisory council regulations or suggestions regarding the use of consumer data. We identified the types of big data being collected, how it's being used, the legal and 
ethical issues with the use of the data and how to better protect consumer information. And I mentioned the fact that it came from our advisory council for a reason. We are, in the way I see it, we're part of an ecosystem here. Certainly in, uh, in Hartford and Connecticut, you know, we're, despite what you may hear elsewhere, we are the insurance capital of the known universe. We've got some great companies that we work with. And we've got great consumer groups, which is why I created an advisory council with all the stakeholders. So things were not being imposed from above. What we were doing was we were getting together and trying to figure out what works for industry, what works for consumers, what works for regulators, what works for everyone, keeping in mind that our primary charge, all as U.S. regulators, is to protect consumers. So big data is a big issue coming up, and we decided that would be the first recommendation from the Advisory Council that we went forward with. And I will tell you, we've had a great response from industry. It's not what I would consider overly onerous, because I think industry as a whole is paying attention to the concerns that have been raised around big data. And yeah, insurance is an industry based on trust. All the regulated entities know this, and they're working with us so that consumers know that trust will not be violated, whether it's with security, whether it's with the marketing of big data, the use of artificial intelligence. You know, you have to be able to trust the people you're buying from, the people that are going to be paying a claim 30 years or 50 years into the future. All right. And uh, the, the, as we move towards the increasing use of big data, we have to develop a framework that will enable consumers to have that trust. That's certainly what we've been doing at the NAIC, and that's what we've done in Connecticut. We want to be at the forefront of big data here in Connecticut. We want to be able to advise insurers what our expectations are. You know, we, we're not, this is not a gotcha game. We're not telling anyone, hey, if you get caught doing this, we're going to come down hard on you. We will, but you will know what we expect going in, what we expect from insurers, what, how, the way you expect you to treat, the way we expect you to treat consumers. People are going to make mistakes. We know that, okay? Innovation by its very nature has to admit for the possibility of failure. And we want to convey that too. You know, we know that there are things that will go wrong. Okay? And it's not going to be anybody's fault. You've tried something new, something great that isn't working, come to us. Okay? You're going to have to, I mean, yeah, some things are the bottom line. You're going to have to make sure consumers are made whole. But we are here to say we believe in innovation. We believe that is a way to, to widen the reach of insurance. And big data can be a big driver for that. Yeah, and I'm using big data colloquially here to refer to technology-driven innovation. That's, that's a route that will enable the industry to thrive. And more importantly for me, will enable consumers to get the insurance they need, the various forms of insurance they need, tailored to them when they need it. So it's really important for us to get that out, to get that conversation started, so that uh, our insureds, as well as our consumers know what to expect. Climate change is another big concern, of course. You know, Connecticut is a big coastal state. We've got uh, probably some of the biggest mansions you're going to find <laughs> sitting there on the shoreline. And that's what people think of sometimes when they think of climate change and what's going to be affected. That's not who I think of. Because frankly, if I'm sitting in a you know, $20 million mansion, I can probably afford to rebuild it if something happens. But what about the people, and we've got lots of towns that grew up from fishing villages, people that have had their homes forever in the family, that are working class people, you know, that climate change is going to affect. How do we address that? You know, we've worked through, we worked with the governor's office through the governor's council on climate change, and we recently issued a report. Here in Connecticut, we will be holding uh, later in the year what uh, is tentatively titled the Connecticut Conference on Climate Change and Insurance. But we want to get all our stakeholders together. You know, the state, federal government, industry, consumers, and academia. Get everybody together to see what we can do. And in the meantime, 
you know, we're working with the, uh, and with the insurers that, that we regulate to see what they can do, how they are preparing for climate change, both in the long term, because there is a long term issue. Where do you invest? How do you mitigate any kind of damages? So we go on that side. But we also have to look at what kind of incentives, if, you, if you're providing homeowners insurance, do you provide incentives to homeowners so that their policy will encourage them to be result to create resilient homes so that if anything happens, it will minimize the damage. And in case there is damage, if you rebuild, you know you're rebuilding for generations, not just till the next storm. And uh, so that's a big issue with us here in uh, in Connecticut, because we've got so much property at risk along the coast. And the governor has been doing, been taking the lead on a number of items. We're happy to be able to work with them. Finally, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Last year, you know, we've seen what happened. We recently saw the verdict in one trial. And I have to say, and I've said this on a number of occasions, but usually not when Director Farmer is is sitting across the screen from me, because then he's going to hold it against me. He's going to think, I really think he's wonderful, but I do think he's wonderful. You know, last year after George, George Floyd, Director Farmer took the lead. I love your ringtone. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. It should have been off. <laughs> the monsters. But Director Farmer took the lead of the NAIC because this was, you know, you look at race and insurance and everybody knows it in a certain sense what it's been like, what the industry has been like, what the concerns have been. And we could have just said, OK, you know, we're worried more about, you know, that we're just going to focus on the risk and that's it. That's not what Director Farmer did. He said, we are going to take the lead on this. We know we as an industry, like the rest of the society, we have a responsibility. And I am, you know, I'm just so proud to be a part of the NAIC, so proud of Director Farmer's leadership and proud that when we all got together, because I got to tell you, you got 56 uh, chief regulators in the NAIC who probably will not agree on what color the flag behind me is. Okay, we've got all different, you know, we come from all different backgrounds, all different political leanings. We see things differently. That's the strength of state regulation. But when we all get together, when you get that focus, when you get 56 people saying, this is something we are going to commit to now and in the future, that too tells you the strength of state regulation. And that's why I'm so proud to have been here. You know, here in Connecticut, of course, you know, we, we're doing, uh, we've made a number of changes. We're trying to do more. Just, I think, within the next week or two, we're going to start another outreach program to the Spanish community. I've mentioned when I started, uh, the, or exams, we're only, we licensed a couple hundred thousand entities. Our exams were only in English. We changed that. So our exams, for instance, are now available in the Spanish language. We've done a number of outreach programs. I named the first chief inclusion officer and we've begun training and we're doing, you know, we're doing outreach to students. We're trying to make this industry as diverse as it possibly can be and make it as inclusive. And I'm doing it because I believe in this industry. I think this is a great industry. I believe, yes, you know, so I've met some of the best people in the world in this industry. And I think together we can make a change. So again, I want to thank Director Farmer for starting us off on this. And here in Connecticut, we realize its importance. We are going to keep working. Thanks, Fred. Well, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Mays, and, and congratulations on your um, ascension, which we all knew would, ha would happen at the NAIC. And you know, we could probably spend the next four days uh, giving accolades to Director Farmer. For those of us like me who've known him for a while, knew that in the year you weren't expecting, but the year that you had, there were very few people that could come out of that year and, and do everything in a way that was beneficial to every constituency. And, and Ray Farmer was one of those rare talents. And so I, I will pile on there, as I know everyone will, will at some point in time and, and say kudos to our good friend, uh, Director Farmer. Uh, but, but before I introduce Director Farmer, um, I'm going to go to our, our other good friend, our other former um, NAIC past president, although I guess that's redundant, former and past, but, but past president, Commissioner Donlin. Commissioner Donlin, 
Uh, Jim Donlin has dedicated his life to his family, to Louisiana, and is just a, a great all around guy. 33 years in the Louisiana Army National Guard, a stint on the Jefferson Parish Council, a stint in the Louisiana House of Representatives, including being the chair of the insurance committee. He has been the insurance commissioner in Louisiana since uh, February of 2006, having after that won elections in uh, 2007, 2011, 2015, and 2019. I dare say he'll be doing again in 2023 if for no other reason than to try and beat Kreidler if Kreidler doesn't go again in, in 2024. And so um, with that, I'd like to uh, ask my good friend Jim Donlin to say a few words about what's going on in the state of Louisiana. Thank you very much, Fred, and thank you for including me in this August panel that you have put together of uh, some of the best and the brightest and certainly uh, the most respected members of my colleagues at the NAIC. It's indeed been a pleasure to serve with each and every one of them and uh, to work with you. This is not my first rodeo with uh, Sila. Uh, we've, we've done those in the past. Uh, in person, in, in Arizona, who knows where, Florida, you name it. Uh, first time I've done it through this media. Uh, and and um, uh, as you know, uh, I barely made the, the kickoff time for today's panel, but all's well that ends well and we're, we're gathered here together. Yeah, but, uh, but that's par for the course for you, Commissioner Donlin. <laughs> that is my reputation. I can't deny it. Uh, but I am really, really pleased to uh, have this opportunity uh, to talk about Louisiana and the challenges we face, uh, unique as they typically are, but with one that per, uh, per, just dominates the entire uh, conversation, not just in insurance, but throughout the world, for that matter. Um, my wife and I feel very blessed uh, to have survived, actually, the past year. Um, we were um, hunkered down at, at our age, um, concerned about the the um, pandemic and, and our vulnerability to it at, at our age. Um, and, and we had a huge um, first uh, session of our governor's second term and a new legislature, majority new legislature, uh, that came into um, place with a mandate of tort reform uh, to lower our second highest in America uh, cost of auto insurance. And um, we went through a regular session and that ended unsuccessfully. Uh, the legislature, I think for the first time in our state's history, called itself back into special session. And we went through a huge effort uh, that I have said repeatedly, I spent 19 years in the legislature, have watched it from the Department of Insurance now for 20 years, and never saw a focus like there was across the board uh, in, the, in that special session that, that um, uh, ended up being all about um, trying to do tort reform and lower our cost of auto insurance. Uh, I went over and testified a half dozen times in different committees. And each time that I entered the Capitol with a mask on and them taking my temperature, I said, are you crazy? Are you really putting your life at risk in order to come testify on, on these bills? And, and that is what I was doing with the concern uppermost in my mind, as with many others that I've talked to, uh, not just about my survivability, but my possibility out and about as I was, unlike my wife, of bringing it home to her and her not uh, surviving that, that challenge. But we're now vaccinated and we're both out and about. This morning was my first air, airplane flight uh, since March 13th, Friday, March the 13th of 2020. And uh, happened to be a flight home to New Orleans from Tampa where I sit in a hotel room doing this, this panel here this afternoon. And uh, uh, not just us, not just the NAIC or the insurance uh, industry worldwide, but the entire globe 
has been through what all of us have been through. And it was certainly the challenge. I have 225 employees. Uh, we didn't lose any. Uh, we did a lot of work from home. Uh, we've been and still are on an A team, B team with half of our workforce in on the 18 days and the other half working from home and vice versa uh, every two weeks. But we return here uh, next month, a, a month from now, to full occupancy of our department, everybody back in the office uh, with, with the leadership of the governor uh, making that um, a, a goal, not a mandate, but a goal of Forest State government. And I'm confident that it will happen. Uh, the year itself, while the pandemic raged, included the worst hurricane season in sheer numbers of events in our state's history. And we are certainly a vulnerable uh, coastal state uh, with the third most, well, actually the one of the top three, I don't know who's one, two, or three, in the past hundred years of hurricane landfalls, Texas, Louisiana, and Florida. We're in that top three somewhere. But last year, we had five um, named storms make landfall in our state. And two of them, three of them actually, ended up being category three or above, in the case of Laura, a category four hurricane that did damage like I did not even see in the aftermath of Katrina, like what happened to Lake Charles with 140 mile an hour uh, winds that that blew through that uh, that southwest corner of our state. Uh, but it is what it is. We are where we are. And we have, and with a lot of your help, Fred, a very vibrant, competitive property insurance market. And what I have seen in the aftermath of those events uh, that have cost private insurers through now $8.8 .8 billion in insured losses as a result of those storms, second only to Katrina Rita in 2005, with Katrina being a $23.4 billion insured loss event, still in pure numbers, the biggest insured loss event in the history of the world, in, in the insurance world globally. Uh, and three weeks later, 3.3 billion more for Hurricane Rita. So now this, this year is in terms of insured losses, number two in our state's history and a significant number two. But as some of my colleagues have said, uh, we are part of a global uh, market and, and industry that we're tasked with regulating. And you've heard some of the, the comments about Director Farmer's leadership last year, how invaluable it was to those of us uh, regulators dealing with regulation of an, of an insurer, insurance industry that was heavily impacted by uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But with his steady hand and leadership into some very difficult, challenging uh, areas, race and insurance, climate, long-term care, all of which I have been involved with as everyone on the panel has been involved with. And um, as the comment was made, all of us have been uh, drinking from a fire hose, uh, dealing with the plethora of very, very challenging issues uh, during the past year. And uh, I look forward to continuing to serve with those uh, you've gathered here and others uh, in addressing these, these challenges, which frankly, uh, get me out of the house every day and make me look forward to getting to my office uh, to dig back in on a daily basis to a uh, hard to imagine combination of, of challenging issues uh, for us regulators. Uh, I'll stop there and happy to try to answer any questions any of your um, participants may have. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Donlin. So it's now my uh, pleasure to introduce Director Farmer. I'm a little concerned that if I say anything further nice about Director Farmer, he will be immediately eligible for sainthood after what we've heard so far. But but I'll proceed. I'll proceed nonetheless. So uh, Director Farmer spent 53 years 
in the industry, capably representing the industry before state government, state legislature. And in 2012, uh, then Governor Haley had the wise, uh, made the wise decision of appointing him as director of the Department of Insurance there. Since then, he has continuously served there with distinction, having uh, been awarded by, uh, by, the, by Governor Haley the Order of the Palmetto, which is the highest award that a civilian can get um, for lifetime service to the state <coughs> of the citizens of South Carolina. That's a great award and, and a very fitting award for someone like uh, Director Farmer. As everyone's mentioned, he served with distinction the last year, which was probably the most incredible year in any of our lifetimes and, and, and helped us all, whether it's the regulatory, uh, the regulators or the regulated through and, and the consumers of the United States through a lot. So the, Director Farmer, thank you for your friendship and thanks for joining us today. <laughs> thank you, Fred. Um, thank you to my fellow commissioners on for, for, for the comments. I wasn't, I, I thought I was beginning to feel a little sick. I thought I was about to, to die here with all, all those things you were saying, but uh, it's all, all, awful kind and I, I appreciate it. And, and as Andy May said, and, and Fred even alluded to it, um, and I think it is going to be on my tombstone, 2020 was not the year we expected, but it was the year, year we got, and, but we made the best of it. Um, you know, it, it, it was my honor to, to be in the, um, in the chair of a president for, for, for that year. And you know, when you come in, as Jim Donlin will, will tell you, the NAIC lets you pick a topic or two that you want to concentrate on and, and uh, work on during your year. And I, I was no different. I wanted us to finish the uh, excellent work that uh, Superintendent Chapa had, had uh, started on long-term care insurance. Uh, and then I wanted to look at um, uh, uh, climate resiliency and, and mitigation. Uh, we started out on those, and then in, in March, obviously, COVID happened, and, and NEIC uh, pivoted on, on a dime, like everybody else, all, all the rest of us had, had, had to do in our own, own departments, and um, COVID was project one. Uh, the NEIC helped each one of us as, as regulators, um, uh, you know, craft bulletins, craft directives, um, uh, guide the industry, provide information to our consumers, and uh, was an invaluable resource as, as we went through that. And, and they still are. Their website that they have established has uh, tons of in information still that's being up updated on, on COVID-19. And then as been alluded to, in end of May, we pivoted again uh, after the uh, since the death of George Floyd. And, you know, we, we came together as 56 diverse jurisdictions. Uh, and we had some, some heart wrenching discussions among ourselves. And then you see what the product was that came out of those discussions of uh, an executive level task force, a special committee, uh, with five work streams and those work streams are, are working hard now. Two of those, uh, look at uh, diversity and inclusion in the industry and among ourselves. And then we look at the three different uh, uh, product lines. Um, and, and, and so it's that effort will continue for a long time with, uh, you know, people like Andy Mays coming b behind. At, at the time I had um, um, uh, the other three officers that are, you know, coming behind behind me, uh, David Altmaier from Florida, Dean Cameron from uh, Idaho and uh, uh, Clara Lindley Myers from Missouri, they all committed to, as part of, of their uh, presidential year to, to um, carrying this issue forward. And then when Andy was, was running, I, I, I think it was an ultimatum. He, he had to do it as, as well, and, and, and he did so graciously. Um, so that effort will continue long, long, um, uh, uh, over a long period of time, and we're, we're proud of it. It's something that needs to be done. Uh, and every now and then you find yourself in, in that position, and, and the NEIC stepped up at, at, uh, at, at the right time. Um, but then, you know, we, we got back to those other two issues, um, you know, long-term care 
uh, task force has picked up where, where they left off and, and is, is working through one of the thorniest problems that uh, 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 this group of regulators, uh, all 56 of us, are, are having right now. That's our most troubled line. And, you know, there's a lot of division um, among the family on, on how to best proceed with all that. But we're like every other issue, we're sitting down at the table working through it. Uh, and then we established the executive committee on uh, our task force on uh, climate and resiliency. And, you know, we, we here again, 56 jurisdictions, all a different opinion. So you have Ricardo Lara from California as a co-chair and I'm the other co-chair. Uh, we bring uh, a, a lot of different perspectives to the table. And you know that that's a, a, another issue that we've got to address, and, and we're doing it um, by continuing to um, uh, chat among ourselves and, and the stakeholders, and, and we're, we're making progress. You saw the NEIC last year join the Sustainable Insurance Forum that uh, Commissioner Kreidler has been a member of for a number of years. Uh, that is an entity that's connected to the United Nations that looks at, at worldwide issues. So the NEIC will have a seat at, at that table as, as well. And so, you know, all of us are participating in NEIC activities, but our day job is, is still around and sometimes it, get, it's, it gets in, in, in the way. Um, as each commissioner is brought up so far, we've got our own particular issues in, in our own, own states. Um, my state is, is, is no different. We have uh, an issue that, um, uh, you know, is unique to us. We're one of the 15 states in this country that does not have the authority to prosecute and investigate insurance fraud. Uh, our state does well in insurance fraud. We're 10th uh, in uh, questionable business claims. We're 10th in health insurance claims, uh, uh, fraudulent claims, and we're number six in, in the nation for staged automobile accidents. But we lead the country in underfunding our fraud bureau. Uh, we are the least funded uh, uh, fraud division in the country, and the responsibility for our uh, investigation, prosecution of insurance fraud rests in, in the office of our attorney general, who has other things they need to be doing. So our legislature is, is meeting now, and we're making progress. We're not quite there yet, but our goal is to have um, – uh, that responsibility in, in our department, and then uh, have have a pretty good budget to go with it, and and so we're we we need one more vote in in, in the Senate on uh, on the statute and the budget, and and we're we're making progress. But um, uh, you know, as as far as uh, COVID nineteen and and uh, working remotely, we we did that. But we've been back for about a month. Everybody, and uh, we're we're. It, it's good to see everybody back. We did okay when we was working at home, but it is um, uh, great to see everybody in, in one location continuing to, 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 to work. Our marketplace um, is pretty stable with the exception of long-term care. Our coastal market that has always been an issue was when I first came eight, eight years ago uh, is, is pretty stable. We're seeing a little bit of tightening, uh, hardening now on, on the rates, um, but uh, Right, right now we're, we're doing well. Our wind pool has lost 67% of its business in the last 10 years, and we're proud of that. They're not going out of business anytime soon, uh, but that means we have a competitive market. And Fred, we appreciate what you've done to help us uh, bring in, in, in companies over, over the years. And in the last eight years, we've added over 100 companies to write uh, property insurance in, in, in this state. Um, but we have other challenges, and, and we will uh, deal with those as they come up. But Fred, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you and, and uh, wait for questions later on. Well, thanks again for being here, and thanks for the acknowledgement on the companies. We've done a lot of good with, uh, with all the Gulf states and up the eastern seaboard, including through Connecticut. And that's something that we're going to continue as the market continues to be stressed over the record hurricane season, the wildfires that Mike is dealt with as well as the um, derecho that, that we talked about a little bit earlier. So thanks again for everything, Director Farmer. We, we appreciate your leadership and appreciate your, your being here today as well as your comments. Um, last but, but certainly not least, as I mentioned earlier, the longest serving uh, insurance commissioner, longest serving elected insurance commissioner as well, uh, Mike Kreidler, 
has been the insurance commissioner since the year 2000 in the state of Washington. He just recently uh, was reelected to his sixth term, counted sixth term in 2020. Prior to uh, his service as insurance commissioner, he was a member of Congress, spent 16 years in the Washington legislature, is a 20-year um, veteran of the Army Reserve, is an optometrist by trade, and is an all-around great guy. And, and so, Commissioner Kreidler, thank you very much for joining us today, and thanks for your public service. <laughs> well, thank you, Fred, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this uh, uh, distinguished group. Uh, I found it interesting that several people have mentioned that they're they're back to work. I noticed that uh, uh, Andy didn't throw in that two bits that they were fully back to work, uh, but uh, it, uh, but I certainly heard it from uh, from from uh, uh, Jim, Jim, and and, uh, and Ray uh, that they were back uh, in the office. Uh, we are not, and I wish I could. Uh, take some of the magic that you have because just trying to get 25% uh, of our workforce back on a regular basis is proving painful coming off of uh, being virtual uh, when they and uh, the reluctance both for safety and because they like being virtual has mm -hmm. been a is a challenge and we had a staff meeting yesterday about that so I got an earful about those resisting. So I'm gonna fall back on these guys that have already successfully uh, brought everybody back uh, as, as an example of what we can do here in the state of Washington. Um, challenges here in the state of Washington uh, uh, that, that I'm personally engaged in, number one would certainly be the issue of uh, equity that several people have uh, mentioned. Um, and it's uh, taken on a national prominence because of uh, of, of Director Farmer's uh, initiative here as president at, at for race and insurance uh, executive task force. Um, in addition to that, here at the state level, I've I've taken it one step further in having a requirement that it, that uh, the proposed a requirement to the legislature, and now have done it uh, because it got slowed down in the legislature by some artificial means. Um, that I uh, have an emergency rule in effect, which the judge will be considering tomorrow uh, a, a, here in the state of Washington in Superior Court as to have emergency order to, to stop the use of credit scoring uh, for uh, on an, uh, at all for the purposes of, of uh, automobile and, and homeowners insurance. Um, and we'll wait and see what, what transpires from that. But it is an issue that I've felt keen about for many years. You know, it's not a surprise to the industry. Um, I, I've been uh, opposing this for over 20 years, 21 to be exact, uh, since I first came in as uh, insurance commissioner. Uh, and, uh, and so this is something that uh, even more so now I'm feeling much more uh, emboldened on because of the, because I think we, we've started to recognize that uh, issues around uh, uh, disparate impact uh, and its impact on low income people and disparate impact on people of color is something that uh, should be avoided uh, at, at all cost. And that's something that I'm working to see if I can get the insurance industry to buy into. I can tell you right now, they're not buying into it. Uh, there's a solid resistance uh, on their part. Um, and so the two major, uh, the Property, Cap Ca Property Casualty Association and NAMIC uh, have joined together and uh, uh, we'll see each other in court uh, tomorrow. As a matter of fact, uh, opposing my, my efforts. What I found interesting is that I did not do outreach before the legislative session as I contemplated putting this bill into the, uh, proposing it to the legislature was to contact all of the CEOs of the major insurance companies. And, uh, and, uh, and all of them had indicated uh, previously in response to, uh, to, to a greater sensitivity of equity um, that uh, and after uh, George Floyd's uh, death, that uh, that they were going to be much more vigorous as insurance companies. 
I asked him about this particular issue of equity, and I, the responses I got back were, were uh, let's say, less than uh, uh, affirmative in supporting the, what, what I was proposing. In fact, they uh, uh, most <clears throat> most never even got back to me. Uh, it, it's, it, it'll be an ongoing. We'll be dealing with this during the next legislative session, and uh, I've got an emergency rule right now, depending on what the the court winds up ruling on that. Uh, uh, for uh, I'm also taking a look at uh, what I might be able to do by bringing uh, a suit. Uh, against the insurance industry, um, and uh, am working with other parties on that to collect the, the data. So this is far from going away, uh, and so it'll be back next legislative session. Um, another very important issue is the one that deals with uh, uh, long-term care insurance. That's been something that, uh, again, uh, Director Farmer uh, uh, heightened to, to, to bring it even to a higher level within the NEIC. As his president of the NEIC um, last year, and we're seeing now uh, a much more co coordinated uh, effort here on the part of state regulators to take on this issue. Uh, it is one that uh, will not go away. Long-term care insurance, uh, there were like 150 companies that were writing it. We're down to less than a dozen now that are act actively writing it. It's a, it's a very tough uh, insurance product as it was originally uh, uh, constructed. Uh, and it's one that uh, uh, we as uh, state regulators are, are challenged that we need to come up with some better uh, better solutions. Uh, and, and the best, most important part of that's gonna be we need to act in a coordinated fashion among insurance regulators. And when I say coordinated in the sense that some states were granting uh, rate increases that were actually justified and some others were not. Uh, you can't reward uh, that kind of behavior from one state to another or you have chaos. And uh, that kind of chaos, particularly as we deal with issues like potential issues around uh, a company called Genworth, uh, which could have a very profound an impact, uh, impact if it were to become insolvent in the future. We need to have uh, a common framework as to how we go forward and deal with it. And several of us are actively engaged right now uh, on the issue of, of, uh, of the senior health insurance uh, of Pennsylvania, SHIP, uh, and we're, we're looking at that from the standpoint of wanting to make sure that this is something that's dealt with by insurance regulators, uh, not turned over to the court. Uh, and the worst scenario, in my opinion, would be that we wind up abrogating our responsibility as insurance regulators, and it's turned over, in effect, to the federal government. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's not in the best interest of, of all of us consume, cons uh, here participating to see that take place because that's a move then away from state-based regulation and effectively moving it more to the federal the federal format. So this is these are uh, th this is one where we're we're going to have some real challenges around the issue of uh, of long-term care insurance and building that kind of coordination. Uh, we did some remarkable things when it came to financial examinations and have and interstate compacts. I think we're going to look at. Uh, need to look at it much the same way of developing that same kind of cohesiveness among the states so we don't have uh, states going different ways, effectively leaving that door open. This is going to be a responsibility uh, as we deal with insolvencies um, and the capacity as of our overall system. Uh, we're, we're going to have to uh, obviously uh, uh, make sure that we're, we're we're working together and not uh, deferring it uh, because uh, this is one that'll. Uh, if you fall back on the on the guarantee funds of states, uh, some many of which, including mine, would not have the capacity if a major if major solvencies take place. Um, that uh, that then it winds up still even being then shifted to the taxpayers because it's a write off against the premium tax, um, and uh, and obviously uh, the legislature 
is not going to be too keen on seeing diminished revenue available to them, much less the policyholders themselves being very unhappy. Uh, and I don't blame them. They're going to look at regulators and wonder why the heck uh, we're in this dilemma, particularly since it's a state regulated product, at least currently. We can do better. I think we will. Climate change has been mentioned. It's also one that I think it is uh, one where, where again, we're, we're moving to a, a new level here. Of, and and uh, Director Farmer mentioned that uh, we're now, as an association, um, participating in, in at, a, at an international level. Um, that's something that is a far step from humble beginnings uh, when uh, in 2005, 2006, when we first got started with having a, just a work group on this issue, uh, there was a lot of resistance uh, from a number of states about uh, about uh, ha collecting information from their domestic uh, companies. Um, and I think that's one where we're starting to recognize now that uh, um, this is one where we, we've got to work together. Uh, if we don't work together uh, to really analyze what's happening in the insurance industry. Uh, we run the risk that uh, product may be compromised in its availability in certain geographic areas, and that tends to get legislators and uh, national public uh, policymakers uh, engaged, and that's one where we'd benefit a great deal if we can step up and be a part of the leadership there uh, going forward uh, as to how we solve this problem. Um, I, again, I, 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 I thank, thank uh, the uh, leadership of, uh, of uh, Director Farmer uh, bringing uh, two of the issues that I certainly see from my, my experience uh, being really paramount uh, to the regulatory scene, which is climate uh, and equity. Uh, and hopefully, uh, by virtue of uh, now having executive task force uh, and uh, that level of involvement, we're going to start to see some real action here on the part of the, of, of insurance regulators to, to bring about the kind of leadership that is needed uh, among the states and is needed nationally. That, uh, Fred, I'm prepared to turn back to whoever uh, goes next. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Kreidler, and um, appreciate all those comments and would like to. I'm getting a lot of uh, I'm getting another call. Jeez, <laughs> I thought that was off. So um, I got to work on that ringtone. I don't know how, well, I don't know why that keeps going off. But in any event, I would say that um, I heard from uh, former Commissioner Doak and former uh, uh, Rhode Island um, Deputy Paul Paluzzi, who both say hi to everyone. So I wanted you all to know that. But um, but but great comments there from, from each of you. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, does anyone, I, I've got some questions. I think we do have some audience questions too. Does anyone have any question that they want to, or any comment they want to um, say that in reaction to anything that was said by any of the other commissioners? Um, because we went through a lot there. So I don't know if anyone, show of hands, anyone wants to say anything, or if you want to move to a couple discrete questions. All right, so with that, let me ask you, Commissioner Kreidler just talked a little bit about, and I'd like to first turn this over maybe to Director Farmer and then see who else wants to uh, take it. But, but obviously there's a lot of pressure on the regulatory community as it relates to um, state-based regulatory system and, and, and what role the feds will play and what role the IAIS might play in some of that policy as well. So. Talk through, if you would, Ray, where we are in, in that regard and, and what your thoughts are in terms of how we get to the best place fo uh, moving forward. Sure. Uh, Fred, in, in internationally, uh, I, I think everybody's aware that um, uh, the United States and uh, the European Union and then subsequently United Kingdom uh, entered into a covered agreement and it requires each each state to uh, uh, adopt legislation on uh, credit for reinsurance, reducing the collateral that reinsurers hold, hold in our, our country. Uh, we've got, um, you know, pretty close to 30 states that have already 
uh, adopted the credit for reinsurance, and we've got uh, probably eight, 17 or 18 that are consider considering it now during their, their legislative sessions. And we've also entered a period of time where FIO is reviewing all, all our actions to see if, if they, um, in, in their words, need to preempt state regulation. Um, and it appears to me that they are just waiting on, on that opportunity. So you'll see each state uh, making progress, I, I think, ad adopting the credit for reinsurance statute and uh, the regulations that, that, that go with it. Uh, but I, I do think that um, there are a number of areas that, um, you know, those that would like to see federal regulation, um, you know, we, we've got to be careful. Of. And the international piece is, is, is just one of them. Agree. Anyone have anything they want to add, Commissioner Mays? I think you might be on mute. Now, can you hear us? Yeah, I, I have to do that at least yes. once per meeting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the Director Farmer and I both serve on the Executive Committee at the IES and, you know, help represent the U.S. and other committees. It's one thing that's important to remember is that this is still the largest insurance market in the world. And we, as U.S. regulators, we recognize the strength of U.S. state regulation. This is a, an industry that has been tested, whether over the past year or you go back to 08 and to that financial crisis. We've been tested. We've survived. We've also adapted. We've changed. But the one thing I will tell you, and I, I will speak for Ray here, I will speak for the other members of Team USA as well. We know that there are products that U.S. U.S. consumers need that, and some other com so some other uh, environments may not be necessary. You may have a social safety net. We know there are ways that we do business in each of our individual states that accurately reflects what the consumers in those states need. Which is why, when we go to these international events, we are, you know, well, I guess that we're proud to stand firm for the USA. Yeah, the, in Abu Dhabi, when uh, there was an attempt to impose the insurance capital standards on the U.S., the, you know, we said, bottom line was, no, we are willing to walk away because we are here. We will not forget or charge, which is to defend U.S., to protect U.S. consumers. And that means ensuring that U.S. consumers have access to certain annuities, for instance, that carry a ridiculously high capital charge of a if an insurer were to offer that in the European Union. And we've, you know, we've worked together with the Federal Reserve, certainly. It'll be interesting to see, you know, there'll be a change in file. We'll see how that goes. But we look forward to continuing our work, and it is an extension of the work that we all do here at the NAIC. Anyone else have anything they want to add? Um, Last question, because we only have about three minutes left, but Commissioner Ridling, you, you talked about, you, you focused a lot on natural disaster, and obviously that's been a big issue up the eastern seaboard, the, the, the Gulf Coast, California now, you know, Commissioner Kreidler faced it with, with wildfires and, and obviously the derecho. Um, what could we do better? I mean, you, you know, Alabama, South Carolina, Louisiana have seen a lot of this have done well, you know, Commissioner Mays talked about the value of some of the homes up there. Is there anything you think we could do better uh, than what we're doing now? Well, yeah, I think there's some things we could do in collaboration of reinsurance arrangements, joint states doing things together. Um, those kinds of things that we've talked about at the zone level for years. I think Jim Donlin and, uh, led some of those conversations. I but I see our I see our relationship a little bit different than than some. Um, I don't see my job as regulating society. I see it as regulating insurance, and to stay in that lane to the extent that I can. And thank you, my friend from the great Northwest, of returning us to the insurance discussion. <laughs> I think that's our lane, and I think that's the lane both us as state insurance commissioners, directors, or whatever, and the NEIC need to remember that is our lane, not society as much as insurance. Thank you. Thank you. Any, um, any other thoughts on, on that question?
question or, or Commissioner Ridling's comments? Well, with that, um, we are out of time. It's amazing how quick an hour goes with um, five people who spend a lot of time in a particular area and have a lot to say. So um, first a point of personal privilege, I'd like to thank my team um, to, uh, at, at Greenberg Traurig um, for their help, Suzanne Platt, Tim Stanfield, and Chris Brito, to Commissioner Riddling, Commissioner Mays, Commissioner Donlin, Director Farmer, and Commissioner Kreidler. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for everything you do, and thank you for your friendship and joining us today. I think this was a great webinar, and I would only ask that you all c consider uh, doing another one with us soon. Thank you, Fred. Thanks, Thanks Fred. Thank Everyone you. Everyone be safe. Bye yes, now. Sure. All right. Thanks, Thanks you guys. I'm going to do a quick... Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Fred. Thanks to, to our panel for taking time with us today. I think we hit a new record on attendance. Great topics, great discussion, amazing progress. Um, thanks also for learning a, a new presentation software. I think <laughs> we, we all had to deal with Big Marker for the for some of us for the first time. I keep telling my IT team if I have to learn one more new application, I'm going to forget something important like how to drive. So. Um, uh, sorry, we didn't have time for questions. I, I sort of thought that would happen. Um, Fred, you did an amazing job coordinating. And thanks again to Greenberg Traurig for sponsoring today. This webinar has been recorded. It will be posted to the Silo Foundation website in the next couple of weeks. You'll be receiving a post-webinar survey, so be sure to fill that out. Help us get better going forward. Silo Foundation provides these webinars free of charge part of our mission and outreach. If you learned something of value today, please consider an individual or corporate donation to the foundation. We do rely on donations to keep programs like these going. And if your firm might be interested in sponsoring a future webinar, just let me know or Mary Ellen Hammock. We'd be happy to talk to you about that. Thanks so much for joining us and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thanks.